And hello, everybody. Hope you guys are well. A little bit of a treat for you guys. I'm going to be reading and sharing some pictures from the book, The Meaning of Icons by Leonid Uspensky and Vladimir Lasky. And I'm going to be reading through the first chapter, first or second chapter. Really, really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. Highly, highly recommend it. Got it a while ago. I don't know how much it costs now, but um, if you are interested in icons and symbolism, I highly recommend this, um, this beautiful book. Um, this chapter I'm going to be reading from is entitled The Meaning and Language of Icons. And it's rather long, so I don't know how much I'll get to, but this is the first kind of section and chapter of the book. And I'll be interspersing um, some pictures, some crude pictures that I'm just taking uh, in the book here of different icons and different stages of development. And I'll be sharing that with you guys. So hope you guys uh, like it. Icons used for prayer that date from the first centuries of Christianity have not reached us, but we know of them both from church tradition and from historical evidence. As we shall see in studying individual images, church tradition traces the first icons back to the lifetime of the Savior himself and the period immediately after him. As it is well known, the art of portrait was at that time flourishing in the Roman Empire. Portraits were made of relatives and of distinguished people. Therefore, there are no grounds for supposing that Christians, especially those of pagan origin, were an exception to the general rule. All the more since, even in Judaism, which adhered to the Old Testament prohibition of images, there existed at the time currents of opinion which accepted human images. In the history of the church, by Cebius, we find, for instance, the following phrase, quote, I have seen a great many portraits of the Savior, of Peter, of Paul, which have been preserved up to our times. Close quote. Before his passage, Cebius describes in detail a statue of the Savior he had seen in the city of Panaeus, in he had he, in Palestine, erected by the woman with the issue of blood, who was healed by the Savior. Eusebius' testimony is all the more valuable since he was personally very antagonistic to icons. Consequently, his reference to the portraits he had seen is accompanied by the disapproving comment that it is a pagan custom. The existence of iconoclastic currents in the first centuries of Christianity is well known and perfectly intelligible. Christian communities were surrounded on all sides by paganism with its idolatry. It was therefore natural that many Christians, both of Jewish and of pagan origin, conscious of the negative experience of paganism, should strive to protect Christianity from the infection of idolatry, which could insinuate itself through artistic creation. Basing themselves on the Old Testament prohibition of images, they denied the possibility of their existence in Christianity as well. However, despite the occurrence of these iconoclastic, iconoclastic tendencies, there existed the fundamental line, which was gradually and consecutively developed in the church through, though with no kind of external formulation. Expression of this fundamental line is given by the church tradition, telling us of the existence of an icon of the Savior during his lifetime and of icons of the Holy Virgin immediately after him. This tradition testifies that right from the beginning, there had been a clear understanding of the significance and possibilities of the image and that the attitude of the church toward it never changed since it is derived from the actual teaching on the divine incarnation. This teaching shows that the image is necessarily inherent in the very essence of Christianity from its inception since, Christia since Christianity is the revelation by God-man not only of the word of God but also of the image. Quote, no man hath seen God at any time the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, close quote, has revealed the image, the icon of God. Through his incarnation, God the Word, quote, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his Father, the Father's person, reveals to the world in his divinity the image of the Father. When Philip asks, quote, Lord, shew us the Father, the Lord answers, have I been so long with you and yet you hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen hath seen he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. As in the bosom of the Father, so after incarnation the Son is consubstantial with the Father, being, according to his divinity, his image, equal in honor. 
this truth revealed in Christianity lies at the foundation of its pictorial art. So the image not only does not contradict the essence of Christianity, but being its basic truth is inalienable connected with it. This is the foundation of the tradition showing that the preaching of Christianity to the world was from the beginning carried out by the church through word and image. Precisely on this basis, the fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council were able to say, quote, the tradition of making images existed even at the time of the preaching of Christianity by the apostles. Iconography is by no means an invention of painters, but is, on the contrary, an established law and tradition of the Catholic Church, close quote. This fact of the image being from the start inherent in Christianity explains its appearance in the church and how it's silently and imperceptibly occupied its place in the church practice as something self-evident, despite the Old Testament prohibition and subsequent opposition. Already in the 4th century, a whole series of church fathers such as Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, Gregory of Nyssa, Jean Chrysostom, and others refer in their works to images as to a normal and generally accepted institution of the church. Of the appearance of icons of the first centuries of Christianity, we have no knowledge and and lack all data for judgment about it. However, on the basis of the latest investigations, it is possible to form a clear idea of the general trend in the art of that period. In his fundamental work on the history of Byzantine art, uh, V. N. Lazarev, examining all the complex circumstances among which early Christian art originated and basing himself on a whole series of previous investigations, arrives at the following conclusion. Quote, while associating itself in many things with classical antiquity, especially with its later more spiritualized forms, it nevertheless evolves for itself a series of individual tasks from the very beginning of its existence. It is by no means a classical antiquity Christianized as Siebel tried to prove. The new thematic content, content of early Christian art was not purely external fact. It reflected a new outlook, a new religion, an understanding of reality that was new by origin. Consequently, the new content could not be clothed in the old forms of antiquity. It needed a style that would express in the best possible manner the spiritual ideals of Christianity. So all the creative efforts of Christian artists were directed towards the elaboration of this style. Close quote. Further, the author refers to the work of Dvorak and speaks of the fact that this new style begins to take shape in, it main, in its main outlines, even in the paintings of the catacombs. The themes of the catacomb paintings, beginning with the ist and the uh, the first and the second centuries include, besides allegorical and symbolical representations such as an anchor, fish, lamb, and so forth, a whole series of pictures drawn from the Old and New Testament. These paintings correspond to the sacred texts, biblical, liturgical, and patristical. The fundamental principle of this art is a pictorial expression of the teaching of the church by representing concrete events of sacred history and indicating their inner meaning. This art is intended not to reflect the problems of life, but to answer them, and thus, from its very inception, it is a vehicle of the gospel teaching. The main outline of the art of the church is already beginning to be formed here. Illusory three-dimensional space is replaced by the plane of reality. The connection between figures and objects becomes conventionally symbolical. The image is reduced to a minimum of detail and a maximum of expressiveness. The great majority of figures are represented with their faces turned towards the congregation, for the importance lies not only in the action and interaction of the persons represented, but also in their state, which is usually a state of prayer. The artist lived and thought in images and reduced forms to the limit of a simplicity, the depth of whose inner content is accessible only to the spiritual eyes. He cleansed his work of everything personal and remained anonymous. His essential concern was to transmit tradition. He understood, on the one hand, the necessity of being cut off from sensory enjoyment, and on the other hand, the need to use all visible nature in order to express the world of the spirit. For to transmit the invisible world to sensory vision demands not hazy fog, but on the contrary, peculiarly peculiar clarity and precision of expression, just 
as to express apprehensions of the heavenly world, the Holy Fathers used particularly clear and exact formulations. The beauty of early Christian art lies in the fact that there was not yet an unfolding of the fullness contained within it, but only a promise of limitless possibilities. That this art was connected with sacred texts does not mean that it was divorced from life. Apart from the fact that it speaks in the pictorial language of its time, its link with life lies not in the representation of one or another event or psychological moment of human life and activity, but in the representation of this activity itself, as for instance representations of different kinds of work of, and profession as a sign that work consecrated to God is sanctified. Moreover, as we have already said, the themes themselves in this art do not reflect the problems of life, but answer them. At that time of martyrdoms, the sufferings are not shown, just as they are not described in liturgical texts. What is shown is not the suffering itself, but the bearing there must be towards it as the reply. This explains the wide popularity in the catacombs of such subjects as Daniel in the lion's den, the martyr Thecla, and so forth. From the very first centuries, Christian art was deeply symbolical and the symbolism was not exclusively the feature of this period of Christian life. It is essentially inseparable from the church art because the spiritual reality represents cannot be transmitted otherwise than through symbols. Yet in the first centuries of Christianity, the symbolism is mostly iconographic, i.e. connected with the subject. For instance, to indicate that the woman holding the baby is the mother of God, next to her is depicted a prophet pointing to a star. To indicate that baptism is the entry of, to a new life, the baptized, even a fully grown man, is represented as a boy or a small child, and so on. Separate symbols were used not only from the Old and New Testament, lamb, good shepherd, fish, but also from pagan mythology, as for instance Cupid and Psyche, Orpheus, etc., and using these myths, Christianity reestablishes their true and profound meaning, filling them with a new content. This adoption by Christianity of elements of pagan art is not limited only to the first period of its existence. Later, too, it takes, the, it takes from the world around it all that may serve it as a means of expression, just as the fathers of the church used the instrument of Greek philosophy, adapting its understanding and language to Christian theology. Through the classical traditions of Alexandrian art, which had preserved Greek Hellenism in its purest form, Christian art becomes here becomes heir to the traditions of the ancient arts of Greece. It attracts elements of art from Egypt, Syria, Asia Minor, etc., introduces into the church all its heritage and uses its attainments for the fullness and perfection of its pictorial language, transforming it all to correspond to the requirements of Christian dogmatics. In other words, Christianity selects and adopts from the pagan world all there was its Christianity selects and adopts from the pagan world all there was of its own, that is, all that was, quote, Christian before Christ, all that was scattered through it as a separate splintered particles of truth and links them together, joining them with the fullness of the revelation. Quote, as this bread was scattered among the hills, but being gathered has become one, so let thy church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into thy kingdom. Close quote. Thus is the idea expressed in the Eucharistic prayer of ancient Christians. This process of gathering is not the influence of the pagan world upon Christianity, but the influx into Christianity of those elements of the pagan world, which by their very nature had to flow into it, it is not a penetration of pagan customs into the church, but their churchification, not a paganization of Christian art, as is often thought, but the Christianization of pagan art. This incorporation with the fullness of the revelation touches all sides of human activity. What is gathered into the church is all in human nature that is inherent, created by God, and this includes creative art, sanctified by its participation in the building of the kingdom of God and the task of the church in the world. Therefore, what the church accepts from the world is determined not by the needs of the church, by, but by those of the world, for in this participation of the world in building the kingdom of God, depending, of course, on its free will, lies in the principal meaning of its existence.
And inversely, the principal meaning of the existence in the world of the church itself is the work of drawing this world into the fullness of the revelation, its salvation. Therefore, the process of gathering, which began in the first centuries of Christianity and the normal and con consequently unceasing work of the church in the world, in other words, this process is not limited to certain particular periods of its existence, but is its constant function. As the church proceeds with its building work, it absorbs and to the end will continue to absorb from outside all that is genuine and true, however scanty and incomplete, and it supplements what is lacking. And it supplements what is lacking. This process does not depersonalize. The church does not reject particularities connected with human nature or with time and place, for example, national, personal, and other features, but it sanctifies their content, filling it with new meaning. In their turn, these particularities do not interfere with the unity of the church, but bring into it new forms of expression peculiar to them. In this way, it realizes that unity and multiplicity and richness and unity which both in totality and, its, and in details expresses the Catholic principle of the church. As applied to the language of art, it means not uniformity or a certain general stereotyped manner, but the expression of a single truth in varied forms of art appropriate to every, pre every people, time, individual man, forms, which allow us to distinguish between icons of differing, na differing nationalities and differing epochs, despite the similarity in their content. As we have said earlier in the conscience of the church, the divine dispensation is organically connected with the image. Therefore, the doctrine relating to the image is not something separate, not an appendix, but follows naturally from the doctrine of salvation, of which it is an inalienable part. In all its fullness, it has been inherent in the church from the very first, but like other aspects of its teaching, it becomes affirmed gradually in response to the needs of the moment, and as for instance in the 82nd rule of the Trulin Council, or in reply to heresies and errors, as in the iconoclastic period. It was the same here as with the dogmatic truth of the two natures of Christ. This truth was professed by the first Christians in a more practical manner by their very life and did not yet have a sufficiently full theoretical formulation, but later by force of external necessity due to the appearance of heresies and false teachings, it was formulated with precision. So too with the icon, the dogmatic basis for its existence was laid down by the Trulin Council of 691 in connection with the change in the symbolism of church art. In the course of its development, that rule mentioned marks a most important stage for here, for the first time it is given direction and principle. This 82nd rule of the Trulin Council says, quote, certain holy icons have the image of a lamb at which is pointing the finger of the forerunner. This lamb is taken as the image of grace representing the true lamb, Christ our God, whom the law foreshadowed. Thus accepting with love the ancient images and shadows as prefigurations and symbols of the truth transmitted to the church, we prefer grace and truth receiving it as the fulfillment of the law. Thus in order to make plain this fulfillment for all eyes to see if only by means of pictures we ordain that from henceforth icons should represent instead of the lamb of the old the human image of the lamb who has taken upon himself the sins of the world christ our god so that through this we may perceive the height of the abasement of god the word and be led to remember his life in the flesh his passion and death for our salvation and the ensuing redemption of the world Close quote. First of all, this rule is an answer to the situation which existed at that time, namely that in church practice, side by side with historical representations, symbols replacing the human image of God were still used. The significance of the 82nd rule lies, first of all, in the fact that it is based on the connection of the icon with the dogma of the truth of the divine incarnation with the life of Christ in the flesh. This is the con this is the commencement of the basing of the icon on Christological dogma, which was later to be widely used and which in the period of iconoclasm was to be further developed by apologists of icons. Moreover, the council discontinues as belonging to a stage already past the use of symbolical subjects in place of the human image of Christ. It is true that the council mentions only one symbolical subject, the lamb. 
Yet immediately after this, it speaks in general rules of, quote, ancient images and shadows, evidently seeing in the Lamb not merely one of the symbols, but of the foremost of them, so that uncovering the meaning of this symbol would naturally lead to the uncovering of all other symbolical subjects. It bases its injunction on the fact that Old Testament prefigurations were fulfilled in the New Testament and ordains transition from the symbols of the Old Testament of the early Christianity to a representation of what they symbolized to the uncovering of their direct meaning to that which was manifested in time and so became accessible to sensory perception, representation, and description. The image appearing in the Old Testament symbol through incarnation becomes reality which in its turn appears as the image of the future glory of God, the image of the height of the abasement of God the Word. The subject itself, the image of Jesus Christ, is a testimony of his coming and his life in the flesh, the kenosis of, his de of the deity, his abasement. And in the way this abasement is represented, the way it's transmitted in visual representation reflects the glory of God. In other words, the abasement of God the word is shown in such a manner that in looking at, at it, we contemplate his divine glory in his human image. And we come to know that his death means salvation and redemption of the world. The latter part of the 82nd rule indicates wherein the symbolism of the icon consists. The symbol is not in the iconography, not in what is represented, but in the method of representing in how it is represented. In other words, the teaching of the church is transmitted not only by the theme, but also by the mode of expression. In this way, the definition of the Trulin Council not only lays down the beginning of the formulation of the dogmatic significance of the icon, but at the same time indicates the possibility of making art reflect by a new symbolism, the glory of God. It emphasizes the meaning and importance of historical reality, showing that a realistic image alone can transmit the teaching of the church and defines all the rest images and shadows as not expressing the fullness of grace although worthy of reverence and capable of satisfying the needs of a certain epoch this statement does not quite abolish the iconographic symbol but makes it auxiliary of second importance essentially this rule lays down the foundation of the iconographic canon that is a certain criterion for judging whether an image is liturgical, just as the domain of words and music, the canon determines whether a text or a hymn is liturgical. It establishes the principle of correspondence with the icon of the Holy Scriptures and defines in what this correspondence consists, the, historic, the historical reality and the kind of symbolism which truly reflects the coming kingdom of God. All right, I'm going to leave it there. So thanks for listening. God bless.